for it then and the guest of honour uh, or one of the guests at the dinner party to launch the book then uh, was Donald Trump <laughs> <laughs> and he has actually RSVP'd this evening <laughs> but it may be because it's in K this is in KGB that he's decided uh, not to not to show up um, but we're very pleased that all of you are here and um, we're also very pleased that Doug Henwood, um, another All Books author, is going to be in discussion with Lewis about the ongoing relevance of money and class in America. So I'll hand it over to them. I would have thought that Trump would have been attracted by the KGB if we're to believe the, uh, the liberal media, right? I love this book, Lewis. I arrived at Yale in 1971, a very undistinguished suburb in New Jersey, and uh, I discovered a whole new species, these people who wore uh, popsiders without socks, uh, you know, the, the wasp, which is something I knew nothing of before I arrived at Yale. I didn't read, I didn't know at the time that uh, these were probably the waiting days of their dominance in American society. Uh, and that the early 80s, just a few years later, would bring the rise of this whole new set of fortunes, you know, finance and tech. Um, so Donald Trump makes a few appearances in your book, and, uh, as does his tower. But he's now our leader. And uh, this whole you know, new class in the 80s is really a very dominant force in American society. Uh, remains so. Um, so has something been lost? by uh, this circulation of elites, as Breda put it? With this Something new, the succession of elites? Something lost? Yes, I mean, uh, by having lost the old cultivated wasp and replaced with these new money Bulgarians. So, should, we be, should we mourn that transition? Um, yes, but I mean, it, 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 it's, uh, I mean, what happens in, in the 80s is, is the, uh, the style of feeling and thought that was part of the New Deal that comes in with Roosevelt in the, in the 30s and lasts through the, through the, through the 60s. It, it's a, one of the rare periods of democracy in American history. And most of American history, it, it's a rigged system rich against the poor, but there are occasional uh, democratic uh, upsurges. I mean, there, there's one in the 1840s and 50s, which ends with the Civil War, and then there's the progressive movement that appears briefly at the turn of the uh, 20th century, and then that is buried by the uh, World War One and, the, and then the heyday of enlightened selfishness in the twenties. Um, then comes back. We, we bring back the, um, the the democratic idea and, and something resembling um, government by the people for the people. And all of, yeah, all of 30s, 40s, and 50s, and it's matched with a period of in, you know, income equality and, and an enormous prosperity. At, at the, the American democracy survives the assassination of Kennedy in, in 1963, but it does not survive the assassination of Bobby Kennedy and, and uh, Martin Luther King and the election of, of Nixon in, in 68. And since then, we, we, we just had a, the increasing dominance of a stupefied plutocracy. And this is predicted uh, by John Adams in the in, uh, 1770s. I mean, he, he foresees what will happen uh, to the United States, to America, uh, and the, his contemporaries regard him as a man who was 
lost his mind. Right? You know, they, they literally think it's crazy because they have this notion of all men are created equal and they have these enlightened enlightenment notions that there there is wisdom in the people and that the uh, and that the forces of history are driven by reason and uh, Adams knew that that was nonsense that the, that the uh, uh, forces of, of, of the history which is driven by by the passions and the uh, but the Federalist Papers are all about restraining the mob and keeping those passions yeah, um, in control. Yes, right. But Adams feared uh, the banks. I mean, he, he, he knew that they were gambling casinos. He knows that in any society that allows for a reasonable degree of freedom, there, ha there will always be an accumulation of wealth by the few. That's the story that's been true from the beginning. I mean, that's you find that in Greece in 500 B.C. I mean, it, it's uh, it's inevitable, and, and the object is to try to uh, put some kind of control or, or regulation on that. So you know that period of the 30s to the 60s, early 70s, yeah. when these base impulses of American society were kept in check by the New yeah. Deal and its aftermath. Yeah. That, what, what produced that, that, that then went away? You mean, why does it go away? Yeah, why did It's always there, it's in human nature. I mean, I mean you, you leave people free to follow their own desires, and, and you're bound to, to create a, a uh, uh, Accumulations of wealth. I mean, it, it can't be helped. I mean, that's there, there's a very fine book uh, published just this last couple of months by a British historian named David Wilton, and it's called Power, Pleasure, and Profit. And that is what the that is what the Enlightenment meant by the word happiness. Now, that's, that, that's seriously, that's... Right, that, no, that's, that's, that's said, that's what Jefferson meant by that declaration. Yes, that's what Jefferson meant. <laughs> uh, it, it, means, it means that men are, all men are created equal in their desire, in, in, in their passions, not in their talents, not in their reasons, not in their circumstances of their birth, not in any other any way you can imagine, except in the most base, or not, it doesn't have to be base, I mean, the fundamental uh, desire for uh, pleasure, power, and profit. I mean, that's what we have. That is how we are all created equal. The last couple of decades have been returned to American impulses of the 19th century. Yes, yeah. Well, yes, to the 19th century, and the impulses are, are, are there. In, in, in 1776, I mean, the, the Constitution is set up. We're set up as a as, a, as an oligarchy, with, which was uh, what the founders had in mind as a republic. It, it, what they had in mind was an enlightened oligarchy, and a, an oligarchy that could find a balance between uh, in a democratic society and a capitalist economy. And a democratic society is the motions of the heart. People caring for each other, that, that is the democratic uh, spirit. And the <coughs> capitalist economy is based on the movement of a market. I mean, capitalism is only interested in inequality. I mean, buy cheap, sell dear. I mean, you I quote mean, um, William Dean Howells, I believe, saying Americans love inequality as much as they love liberty. Yes. They what, do. what is that? I mean, we love inequality. I mean, I mean, which, that, which Americans love inequality? All of us, <laughs> or the people who benefit from it? 
certainly the people who benefit from it, and, and then the people who are expectant cap capitalists and hope to uh, share in the spoils. Temporarily embarrassed millionaires, right? Yes. Temporarily short of funds. Yes. <laughs> uh, Reagan appears a lot in, uh, in your uh, book, um, 30 years ago. Um, and you know, we remember him now as pretty simple-minded. Um, but you, know, you can look back at his speeches he gave to the Conservative Political Action Congress in the 70s. And, you know, he endeavored to speak uh, philosophically. He purported to have a, uh, a political philosophy with conservatism. He quoted Hayek and Burke. It's impossible to imagine Trump doing anything like that. <laughs> Have we gone from circling the drain to being like accelerating our way down the pipe? <laughs> yeah, no, no. I mean, we're, yes, it's accelerating. I mean, it's been accelerating ever since Reagan. I mean, the, uh, <clears throat> Reagan comes, you know, his, his uh, campaign slogan is, I want this country to be a country where everybody can get rich. That was his idea. If you remember, <clears throat> He has just as swinish a cabinet as, as uh, Trump. I mean, 117 Reagan appointees were either indicted or convicted for one form of criminal fraud. I mean, you know, God, I mean, it's, it, 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 uh, it's easy to forget James Watt, but it shouldn't be forgotten. No, I mean, so. Yeah, no, he, 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 he was, you know, and, and his other campaign theme was make America great again. Take it back to the, uh, the good old days of, of the, when John Wayne was making us safe from the Apaches and, and the and absolutely imaginary creation of the American past. It, 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 it was bullshit. Uh, but well, it was, he helped liberate Auschwitz too, right? Yes, and he also helped it, you know, win the Cold War against the Russians. <laughs> yeah, why? Right. But the, the, uh, I mean, but, but, no, he, for Trump, as it was for Reagan, Bush, father and son, Clinton and Obama, money is the true, the good, and the beautiful. Period, and that's the end of the story, as far as they're concerned. Yeah, it's interesting, and, and that's what Adams foresees. Adams says, "What this country, you know, allow the, allow money to uh, control uh, our politics, yeah, and we will end up with a powerful but pathetic uh, despotism." Uh, that, there's mean, that uh, famous quote from FDR in 1936, I believe, where he said, described himself as like the rich really hate me. They've never hated someone so much, and I welcome their hatred. Uh, it's impossible to imagine you know, Obama, who came into office in the midst of the worst financial crisis since those days, uh, saying anything like that. It seemed like he craved their love. Absolutely. I mean, you know, I mean, lick the boot. I mean, I mean, Obama, God, the media. No, I mean, he's, he's a tool of the banks. And, and the uh, and, and and a pleasant one. I mean, I mean, you know, I mean, I mean you know, <laughs> as was Clinton. As was, you know, we, we are now going to have the, you know, the, the hagiography that is going on now about George H. W. Bush makes you sick. Uh, but but the thing is, it's nonpartisan. I mean, the adoration of, of the New York Times is the same as the adoration of Fox News. This, you know, this great man, mm, yeah. this, this great gentleman has passed from among us. AP actually <laughs> retracted a tweet uh, on Bush's death because it was they were called out by the right for being too rude about it, but pointing out that he was not a war hero, but that he lost the 1992 election. So they're intimidated into withdrawing this uh, initial report. Um, you have a very witty uh, um, contrast of old money and new money. Yeah. About 14 points. Which I can't remember any of them. I know. I'm not going to ask you to recite them. But I, you know, that, that, that quote from Roosevelt uh, reflects a guy who was born into that class and had the confidence to step on its toes. That's true. I, so, I, what about the difference in psychology between somebody like him who was born to this uh, sense of entitlement? And the current crop of rich people who have like clawed their way into wealth and power. Uh, is there some 
kind of different culture that those things produce? Well, I mean, I mean, there's still, I mean, there's the notion of uh, noblesse oblige, which 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 Roosevelt has, having been born into the, uh, you know, into the privileged class. He's a patrician, but but that's the same thing that is true of the front of the founding generation. Um, Constitution 1787, nobody believes that all men are created. Maybe in the eyes of God, but they're not equal on the streets of Philadelphia. They're not equal in the... Some are more equal than others. <laughs> Cotton Mather is, speaks to the congregation in, in, uh, <coughs> in, the, uh, in, in, what, in Boston, Cambridge, and Many of them, of course, have been our indentured servants, and he says to them, "We own you. We own your feet. We own your hands. We, you know, you're basic. I mean, that's that's the way it was in Boston. That's the way it was in Philadelphia, and that is certainly the way it is on Jefferson's plantation in in, in Monticello. <laughs> so, yes, equal in the eyes of God, equal in terms of of their." Uh, desire for pleasure, profit, and, and uh, power, <laughs> but um, and Madison says very clearly that, that that it's a an oligarchy, government, and this is his quote. I mean, he says government uh, has to be managed by people with um, the uh, wisdom to to discern and the virtue to pursue the uh, common good of the society. And these had to be people of wealth. All the people that are signing the Constitution are men of property. There is freedom for property in the, in the Constitution, but there's no freedom for people. <coughs> the, the, uh, well, they did tack on that Bill of Rights. They did, very reluctantly. <laughs> <laughs> But on the other hand, you still have uh, blacks being counted as three fifths of the human being. Which was the progressive position because <laughs> the reactionaries wanted to count them as zero, right? Yes, but I mean, also, you, you have to remember that all the way through the 19th century, uh, the, the whole economy of the United States is based on slavery, cotton. Cotton is uh, to, the, to America in the 19th century what oil is to the to the Arabs. And, uh, we, it's our major source of, of foreign exchange. It was, it's what provides the money, you know, the British money to come in and fund the, the uh, economic development of, 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 of America. And the, That's what made uh, New York rich, yeah. too, trading. Yes, and, and the, the, the uh, yeah, and, and, and the, the uh, but on both sides, both north and south, the, the notion of freeing the slaves, what do you do with the slaves after you free them? And the opinion, north and south, is send them out of the country. That's what all the abolitionists thought. They, they had no intention of making them uh, part of American society. No. I mean, it, it, I mean, Jefferson says this with, with the, when he signs the uh, Louisiana Purchase and says that the settlement of the country, of, of the new lands, you know, west and, and, and are open to settlement uh, by white people. And the black people have to be sent you know, he had ideas to send them to Caribbean, he had ideas to send them to back to Africa. <clears throat> but the abolitionists felt the same way. The, the freeing of the slaves meant that they should be shipped out. I mean, that's the reason we still have the, 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 uh, the problem of black and white in this country. We can't, you know, it's complete denial. I mean. 
the, the population, the black population in 1776 in America is 20 percent higher than it is now. And we, we, we try to pretend that that doesn't exist. I mean, we, we start as a biracial society, but we don't want to believe that. Yeah, well, it's a society founded on Indian genocide and black slavery. Yeah, so but like, until we learn to believe that, we're never going to solve the, uh, the uh, animosity. No, and it doesn't seem like we're making any progress in that direction right now. It did seem like we were making some progress, you know, from Brown v. Board of Education through the 70s, but uh, Reagan yeah, but began you, his political you, campaign in 80 in Philadelphia, Mississippi, and uh, it has been downhill since then. Um, well, this off the topic of distribution of wealth. Yes, the distribution. Which, which, which well, you know, but the, the slave population was an enormous bit of the American capital stock. You know, yeah, no, a, sure. If you look at Piketty's book, it's a very enormous portion yeah. of the American capital stock. And it was, the freeing of the slaves was the greatest act of, you know, capital expropriation in history. So yeah. The, uh, that, that's an unpopular view, though. No, no, maybe it isn't. Maybe, maybe, maybe it's, it's come back into... Anyway, okay. <laughs> yeah. Let, let's talk some about the culture of the present. Uh, you writing about the culture of the 80s in which you know, glitz and money were very so yeah. enormously uh, dominant. Uh, and, you know, there were all these celebrity artists, like Julian Schnabel, you know, and then there's celebrity novelists like Brett Ellis. Do we have anybody like that today? What, what happened to that kind of, uh, the, the merger of celebrity and the arts that was so characteristic of the 80s? Is, is it, I mean, it seems like the kids are all broke now. There's really nobody like that. I don't know who are celebrity. It seems like we had no. them. Am I missing something? But like there's, no. I guess the point I'm going after is that we've even had a devolution from the level of the 80s. <laughs> <laughs> no, our celebrities today are, <coughs> movie stars or, or uh, Kim Kardashian, I mean, I, I don't know, this is people that appear on pop, pop singers. I mean, those are our celebrities. Yeah. I don't think of any, any, any writers who are celebrities. Although they, Pamela Anderson's been writing a, a good analysis yes. of French riots on Twitter, so <laughs> that's progress of some sort. Um, no, 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 that's interesting because in, in, in uh, the celebrity writer, I mean, the before 19, literally before 1960, on the cover of Time magazine, you had Saul Bellow, John Updike, Philip Roth, um, Norman Mailer, right? And I don't think there's been a writer on the cover of, of uh, Time magazine since. Yep, I'm sorry, one exception. Franzen. Franzen was on the cover of, of Time a couple of years ago as compared to Leo Tolstoy. <laughs> I mean, what do you do with that? I mean, I, I, I don't know. Well, I, I, I saw this somewhere uh, recently that um, the word rate at Harper's Magazine you edited for many years was a dollar in the 60s, and now it's still like a dollar a word now. And in the 60s, uh, someone said you could buy, you know, you could. If you publish one article in Harper's, you could buy your friend's dinner to Lane's for months afterwards. And now, you know, there's nothing. Like, there's just nothing to support uh, someone trying to do a career in journalism or the arts now, the way there was even, you know, back recently in American history. No, I mean, you know, that's true. I mean, I, I, um, I uh, went to Yale. I went to both Hoshka's school and, and Yale University, a friend of mine close friend, both, both Hoshkiss and Yale, was a man named Parker Gilbert. Parker Gilbert ended up as the uh, chairman of Morgan Stanley. Okay. But when I first come to New York... Two last names. He, uh, fits yeah. The when, 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 when I first come to New York in 1960, uh, we both have apartments so on the Upper East Side. I was living on 78th Street. He was living on 74th. My rent was three hundred dollars a month. I was making as a contract writer in 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 the sixties for both the Saturday Post and Life. I was making 
$40,000 a year, which was what Parker was making as a young managing partner at Morgan Stanley. Wow. Uh, the, uh, we could afford to go to the same restaurants and, and uh, talk to the same people. Right? And we could afford to know each other. <laughs> <laughs> and that's true even up until my, my father was the uh, vice chairman of um, Bankers Trust in, in um, 1972, and he was one of the most highly paid bankers in New York. He was making $165,000 a year. And what happens in the 70s, and continues to happen, I mean, at increasing speed through the, through the 80s, 90s, and till now, is it, it just goes like that. I mean, the Harper's Magazine was paying $5,000 an article in the 19, late 1960s. And they're still paying that. Yeah, I got $6,000 <laughs> in my Hillary article. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so, it, 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 it just, uh, I mean, the division happens very bluntly. But that was all part of that, uh, you know, the 30s, the 60s compression of things. You know, uh, Richard Hofstadter says that the, that that period was a real exception in American history. Where there yes, was, he's right. Well, it was a notion of the importance of the state, but also a notion of collectivity uh, and the broad population. And uh, that was equality, the exception of what e before yeah. and then what after. Equality is the exception, not the rule. And Hofstadter is a wonderful book, I think. I mean, and the American political tradition. Yeah. yeah, he makes it clear. I mean, it is also made clear uh, in uh, the by Adams. I mean, and you, you can read this whole argument in the letters between Adams and Jefferson. You know, after they're both out of office. I mean, the letter, they write each other letters between 1816 and 1826. They both die on the same day, on July 4th, 1826, and they were political opponents, but now they're both out of office and they, but they, they also were lifelong friends. And, and Jefferson says so, he makes it very clear, he says, quote, money, not morality, is the principle of commerce and commercial nations. And we are a commercial nation, and always have been. And the, the, um, but it does say in God we trust in the money. We have, you know, yeah. money and God. Yeah. Right. Money and God. Or money is our God. They put that in in 1956, I think. I mean, it used to be plural but the, the point is this book is published in 1988. It, it's as good today as it was 30 years ago. But it came out just after the 1987 stock market crash. People thought things were falling apart. They thought for a little while it was 1929 all over again. It didn't turn out that way, but, no, but no, when no. you were writing it, did you have that, that sense that the crash had ended a certain era? Did you think it was going to continue into the present? No, I, 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 I didn't. I, I, I thought there would be some form of uh, comeuppance in, in, in the real world, <laughs> and I was wrong. And <laughs> the, uh, um, but no, what, what, what they didn't accept when, when this was published, and they still don't want to accept it, is you, you know, I mean, when, when David Brooks reviewed this book in 1988 for the Wall Street Journal, I was pointing out that there was a class system in, in, in America, right? And Brooks got very, you know, upset. There is no such thing as a class system in America. You know, that's, that's you know, left-wing can't. <laughs> and, 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 and straightforward denial. And we're still denying it. I mean, you read, you know, our official historian, I mean, John Beecham's a book on the American soul that came out. It, it, again, no class system in America. We're all born equal. American exceptionalism, that awful idea that was promoted by Jefferson, that, that Americans are unlike any other human beings that have ever walk the face of the earth. That's the main difference between Adams and Jefferson. <coughs> Adam 
Adams talks about history as the lamp of experience and that from which we can learn and, and uh, know who we are. Jefferson denies that. I mean, it's Jefferson's enlightenment, right? He wants to believe that men are moved by reason, that the people, uh, the voice of the people is wise. <laughs> uh, <Some> I mean, <laughs> no, 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 the, the, the box populated. I mean, the, 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 the uh, I don't know, the, the, and we, we and, and we're still promoting these ideas. I mean, that, I mean that's PBS, David Brooks. I mean, the, the uh, Legion of But he's the liberal favorite conservative now, too. Uh, you write no, about it, it, yes, sorry. you write about the passion for security among the rich, the uh, yes. the inaccessible entrance, the the, the, yeah. the phalanx of concierges and doormen, yeah. and, uh, the elevators and the gates and all that. Rachel Sherman, who's a sociologist, uh, had a book came out a year or two ago, in which she uh, interviewed a bunch of new rich people in New York, and they were all terrified of losing their money. They were like just inches away from losing everything. Um, was that a common uh, anxiety in the class you were born into? Did people worry about their loss of status, or did they feel? Oh yeah, scared? sure. It's terrifying. I mean, they're they're, they're, they're really frightened. <laughs> and, and again, Adams makes the, the same point, and so does Solon, the giver of laws in, in Greece, in 500 BC, makes the same. Point. And, and at a certain point. You, you know, you begin to believe that your money is yourself, and, and that the um, to ask you for ask the rich for money is like asking them for blood. <laughs> they yes, they tend to be very very uh, frightened, particularly the you know the, the old money. I mean, old people that inherit it. The new money is is not so scared of it. That's why they manage to make it, <laughs> but, it, but it, it, if, it, if, it, if it's inherited, uh, it, it, it tends to be magical and, and um, you know, this great sort of Aladdin's lamp in the vault, and, and God forbid that, that you should offend it or, or touch it or harm it in any way because it, it is, after all, your, your life. The sense of having been born into it didn't provide any security or, or, or compensatory pleasures of having a pedigree? No, that didn't work with me. I, I, I don't know why. I mean, the, the, the uh, uh, no, I, I was... Well, you're, you're a rebel within your class, though. Well, yes, I, I guess so. I mean, you could have said the same thing about, uh, people said the same thing about Franklin Roosevelt, but, but uh, you're just trying to get a, away from the from the, ma the ma ma money can seem like magic, and, and you, you try to get out from under the under the shroud of, of, of the uh, fear of it. And my father was terrified of it. He was a banker. <laughs> <laughs> what, what was he afraid of? I mean, money was the elephant always in the room. Whose will is done on earth as it is in heaven, and, and the uh, <coughs> you know you can't. <coughs> With money, you can walk through the world as uh, as money's guest. Right? I mean Nelson Rockefeller, America's guest. God. <laughs> uh, I, I was on the campaign plane with, with, with Rockefeller when he was running for president in that, or candidate for president in 1968. Yeah. Hopeless. <laughs> 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 but when he appeared before Congress, the, 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 the Congress just couldn't get over the fact that he was, he was rich. I mean, so they... They couldn't really ask him hard questions. <laughs> he wasn't really rich. He was a Rockefeller. <laughs> yeah. I mean, uh, you know, the whole dream of American empire is fear. I mean, number one, right? We, 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 we invade uh, Bush's invasion of, of uh, uh, 
Iraq in, in, in 19... Uh, I mean, you know, in, in, in 2003 is... Well, now, now Trump thinks a bunch of impoverished Honduran refugees are about to suck our life blood. Right. Uh, getting back to... I mean, I'm, I, you know, to me, it, it's a, the, the puzzle is here are people that have everything. I mean, we, we have the richest society in the history of mankind, and, and the rich people among, among us are rich beyond the dreams of, of, of Croesus. And why are they so scared? Yeah, well, I, the, the, this, this new generation of plutocrats, too, there, you know, you've got people like Peter Thiel who are uh, busy building bunkers uh, for, yeah. for, for, for fear of the apocalypse. And you've got, you know, Thiel also, uh, like, trying to create a little refuge in New Zealand he can run to when the shit really hits the fan. What, what is this? I mean, is, are they, they have a bad conscience that they're afraid that they're, you know, the, the, the hordes are going to slit their throats? What is this all about? I, 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 um, I, I, I fail to answer that question. I mean, that is a, one of the questions that I present myself with writing this book, and it's still an open question. I, I remember I had a number of uh, possible uh, answers to it, but I can't remember now what they were. <laughs> Yeah. I, I like the guilty conscience explanation. Uh, well, that's entirely possible. Will anything ever change this structure? I, yeah, yeah, it seems something. like you hope at one point that the, the elites would come to some sort of enlightened uh, self-understanding or be born again in some decent sense. But you also, um, you have no taste of the class war. You portray the bourgeoisie as a bunch of uh, deluded and pampered adults. Um, you know, rather than the masters of some exploitative system. You're not interested in you know, the, the masses rising up. You know, that, that was what uh, made Roosevelt possible. That's what made the New Deal possible, is the fear of elites that they're about to lose everything. So is there anything that's going to get us out of this, or will it just be well, from no, fear no. just climate catastrophe and, and social collapse? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I think, yeah, that's right. <laughs> climate catastrophe and social collapse. I mean, yeah. I mean, that will... Attract people's attention. I guess. <laughs> so we can't keep from driving the car off the road into the ditch. No, I don't think so. I mean, I, I, I think it's going to take driving it into the ditch in order to awaken people to the uh, fact that they've been living in a hall of mirrors. Mm. <laughs> We're just supposed to conclude these things, you know, like right. sort of optimistic note, but uh, <laughs> this no, does no, appeal to my no, temperamental no, pessimism, no, but you know, no, this is actually going a little further than I would hope. <laughs> but yeah, but that's the, that, that's the, you know, that's, you, you look at the history of, you know, over the long range, and that's the kind of diastole and systole of, of the way it works. I mean, you, you know, the, if, the, if the income inequality gets so far out of hand, it leads up either to collapse or a revolution. I mean, it, 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 you either figure out how to redistribute the wealth, and, or um, you end up with revolution, which is a sort of general distribution of poverty. <laughs> I mean, there aren't many options. I mean, you, I mean, you, I mean you, that's the historical record. If you, if you read it that way. So, but, I mean, mean, as individuals... Out of yeah. control wildfires and rising seas and uh, right. war of each against all. Um, well, when does this start? Like, well, uh, we're already in it? No. Yeah, we're in it. And we've been in it since, you know, Hobbes makes the point in, in, uh, in the 17th century. <laughs> a man is, uh, you know, uh, the value of a man is his price. Well, but I mean, civilization I mean, has managed to continue for the last 400 years, so like... Well... Uh, uh, do we have another 400 years? Uh, or, uh, uh, what do you mean in civilizations for 400 years? What you well, you said about? Hobbes for the 17th century. Oh, you know. uh, okay. All right, but I mean, you're, are you... Are, are you going to present to me the 20th century as a high point of civilization? No, certainly not. <laughs> okay, so... Um, um, 
curious as to no, I just how you define it's, civilization. It, it's your view that it's just things are just going to get worse and worse and worse until like, you know, we're overcome by apocalyptic, apocalyptic No, no, I mean, you know. Is there any political hope to be Yes, had? you know, there's a lot of political hope. I mean, we, we can come up with, with, with a new idea. We have no idea where it will start. It, it's, um, history is, you know, it's not vast forces, I mean, it, it, it's, uh, um, it's contingent, uh, history is, is uh, it's, it's always a surprise, there, there can be a renewal, I mean, who knew, you know, there can be another variation on the, on the, on the impulse of, of the Enlightenment, the impulse of, of, of the Declaration of Independence. There could be another variation on, um, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> on an idea that comes out of nowhere. I mean, we, and I can't tell you where it's coming from, but it's got to, it will come. I mean, we, we are not going to, unless, of course, we manage to eliminate the human race, which is possible to. <laughs> so, you know, I mean, the, the um, <laughs> I mean, that was that was Einstein's idea. The only thing that stood between the elimination of the human race is, is the uh, is education. Well, but Einstein was a socialist too. Yes, but I mean, socialism is you know can be defined in lots of different ways. Right? I mean, the largest social inst socialist. Institution in, in the United in, in that I know of is the American military. <laughs> yes, <laughs> that is a socialist society. That's a little narrower than socialism in one country. No, I mean it's, 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 it's an operative. Uh, it's an operating socialism. Yeah, it works very well for them. The United States Army is the biggest daycare center. Yeah. Okay. okay. <laughs> we won't go into that. No, it's a very healthy no. life. It's but it hasn't won a war, by the way, in 75 years. <laughs> <laughs> they can kill them. They're very good at killing people. Well, I mean, that's the that's other option. I mean, uh, the, the way to solve the you know, environmental problem. The problem is that, that the resources of the earth will not sustain infinite growth. Uh, the, uh, that is becoming quite clear. Um, so you read all the projections about war against all against all and resource war, you know, the various results of, you know, migration. I mean, there were a lot of, a lot of books about this, and the, the uh, and, and projections, and, and the um, finite resources cannot, cannot uh, sustain infinite demand and, and the <coughs> and technology is not going to solve our problem so you know we, we live in an age convinced that technology will is the salvation of the human race but it's not technology doesn't uh, know what the human race is I mean Alexis Alexa and Watson can, can uh, attach themselves, can access the Library of Congress, but they can't read the books. They don't know how to read, they don't know what the words mean. So uh, they can't hack into the enormous uh, fund of human consciousness, which is history, art, religion, civilization. They don't know what that is. And, and they, they, machines cannot make a future fit for human beings. They can make a future fit for machines. And the, the, um, so that's a dead end. <laughs> Literally a dead end. Yes. And the, um, the, the, because a machine doesn't know where, I mean, they, they can, they can, we can connect the dots, right? The ATM, the Tinder, the trades for Goldman Sachs, the art scans, and so forth and so on. But they only connect the dots to other dots. <laughs> I 
What's it all mean, Alexa? <laughs> uh, she, she's not going to answer that question. She doesn't know. Um, and the, uh, nor does she care. <laughs> but Jeff Bezos cares. Jeff Bezos cares. Yeah, Jeff Bezos cares. But, uh, yeah. but okay. you know, in, in this moment, it seems like we're being run. The people in charge of the Republican Party, the Trump administration, are a portion of the elite that is really characterized by a rapaciousness, a short-termism, uh, a sense of just a bunch of asset strippers. They're not the least bit interested in building anything. It's like now we've got the Trump administration wanted to you know, drill in Alaska or the Arctic. Um, at the moment, when you know wildfires are bursting out all over the place, and oceans are rising. Uh, you know, what is it with these people? Have they completely, uh, you know, taken over the the, the, uh, the, the um, institutions of power in the United no, States? No, it's good. It goes back to. What do you mean by the pursuit of happiness? It's called power, pleasure, and profit. What else is there? I, mean, I hope a more elevated notion of happiness and beauty than that. <laughs> what, what, well, what I mean, you know, but, but uh, that's the one that's in, in, in office. Yeah, that's the one that's running Fox News and the Trump administration. And was also running Reagan and, and the, uh, Roosevelt. I mean, Brandeis in 1933 says to Roosevelt, "We must make our choice. We can have democracy, or we can have the accumulation of wealth in the hands of a few, but we cannot have both." Somebody made that decision for us. We, uh, well, I mean, you know, Roosevelt uh, tried to cho uh, choose democracy, right? Yeah. Um, Adams understood the same question. I mean, this, what I'm talking about in this book has been going on a long time in the United States. And the, 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 uh, and, and the periods of equality are, are, are uh, exceptions, relatively few and far between. <coughs> but you have to find a balance. If you can't find the balance, then you're going to force the some kind of, of catastrophic or revolutionary um, uh, crisis. Accumulation of wealth in the hands of a few, it, 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 it becomes despotism. What Adams called an oligarchic junto. That was the term in, in uh, the 1780s. But it doesn't matter whether it's an emperor or a uh, military governor or an emperor or a and a despotism, and it's, it's, it's all the same thing. <coughs> it's the, it's the, the few power and, and in the hands of the few. Would we better be better off if the few are better than they are now, or? Yes, sure we would. I mean, that, that was what Adams, was, I mean, that's what Madison's point was. And, and when Madison says, Country, we would put the, hand, the country in the hands of the people with the wisdom to discern and the virtue to pursue the common good. That's what he meant. So we and need a better set of overlords. Yes, that's right. <laughs> and all you know, all oligarchies start that way with a with a band of uh, brothers who, who are. I mean, and this is you know, this is Plato. But over time. Uh, Oligarchy, uh, uh, wealth accumulates and men decay. <laughs> Oligarchies like cheese, it turns rancid in the sun. <laughs> and, and, and the the uh, and fish run from the head. And and Madison and all of well, certainly Madison, most well, Madison's ideas on the law, it it, it requires constant attention. It requires people constantly tinkering with the balance between democratic society and capitalist economy. It, it's, it takes work. 
it takes quote paying attention. <laughs> and it's boring. <laughs> Alexa make us a better overlord. So. <laughs> um, okay, on that um, happy note. Happy note. Perhaps we can uh, see if anybody in the audience has uh, comments or questions. I feel like this conversation is so defeatist and that it's like we're not acknowledging that millions of people in this country uh, supported Bernie Sanders. Um, so many people in this city have supported Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and really want something that's different. When we talk about Americans love inequality, I don't know that all Americans love inequality. I think a lot of Americans, is, it's just never occurred to them that they could live without inequality. So are you, are you observing these, these threads? Well. No, no, I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful it'll turn into something. I mean, maybe they, it will show up at, in, uh, in, in the uh, new Democratic uh, majority of the House. I mean, maybe it will turn itself into law. But as long as it's a matter of just simply pose and attitude, it's meaningless. <laughs> I mean, the question is, can you put it in, in, into, into action? And, and I hope it, it, it's possible. I mean, it, we, we've done it before. And it, 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 there's no reason to say we can't do it again. But it, it, it's, um, it's harder to do than it looks. And it's not just a matter of striking poses in front of a television camera. My hesitation is because of our <coughs> means of communication and because of our and because of the internet, and because of television. The um, <coughs> democracy uh, it, uh, is based on the, uh, the meaning and value of words. And it, it, it also implies uh, a form of coherent linear thought. there is such a thing as cause and effect. Mm -hmm. The electronic, that is, is the style of feeling and thought of print. The, styling, the style and feeling of thought of the electronic media, television and the internet, has no value. There is no value in words at all. Words do not matter on, on the internet. And the, the uh, so, and also there is nothing, there is no uh, cause and effect, there is no sequence that goes around in circles. And Trump has been very effective at deploying That's word right. bombs on the internet. Yes, no? but, but, but they are just that, they are bombs, they are, they are not thought. Right. <laughs> the, 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 uh, the, essentially they're meaningless. And, and the, uh, so, I mean, we have a, a, a serious problem, I, I think, in, in, in our means of communication. How do you form a politics fit for human beings when your languages are made for machines? Yeah. I mean, the language made for television and the internet is made for machines. The language in the and, 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 and the internet is, is, is made by algorithms. Now, you, you're not talking to human beings. <coughs> you're, uh, uh, how do you make, I mean, I mean this is a problem that, that uh, the founders are facing too. How do you build a future, future fit for human beings? It takes account of both the democratic society and, and the capitalism. Mm. And I don't know how we do that without words. Trump understands that. Mm. You know, his Twitters are utterly thoughtless. He doesn't care. I mean, it, it, it's not lying because he doesn't... <laughs> there is no truth. I mean, he's... <laughs> But it's it's language made for 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 TV. He was at the first book party for this. Yes, because in 1988, 
This book is published in 1988, and the, uh, Trump was the, the absolute hero of, of the age. He was on the cover of Time magazine in 1988. He was on the cover of, of Playboy. At Yale University, in, in the dorm, dorms, uh, where in the 60s there were pictures of uh, Dylan and Che. In 1988, the pictures were Trump on the kids' room dorm walls. And so <clears throat> the publisher, the first publisher of the book was uh, published by Ann Getty, a billionaire who had just bought the, the, it was commissioned by a publisher called Weidenfeld Nicholson and then bought by Ann Getty. And, and she wanted, she had a big apartment on Fifth Avenue and she, and she wanted to give a fancy launch party and so she invited um, Trump because Trump was to have Trump attend your party in, in 1988 was to give it substance. It, 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 was, it, was, it was like the blessing of mammon. It was like getting, you know, Tina Brown to come to your goddamn lunch. I mean, the, uh, the, uh, so, <coughs> um, and that was like so, a year before his first bankruptcy. So, 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 so there he was. I mean, he was, you know, he was a table warmer. And, and the, uh, <laughs> but, but, but that's the way it was in 1988. And unfortunately, it still is. And I thought it was, it was going to be over. I, I, I thought we were going to come across some kind of crisis where it, it, it would force a, a, uh, a readjustment or an, a, uh, uh, an understanding on the part of large numbers of people to the extent that they were being ripped off. Mm. But that recognition... People thought that about 2008, it didn't happen then either? No. <laughs> you know, I, I thought after 9-11 there would be some return to an idea of, of uh, uh, such a thing as the American public interest or such a thing as a race publica, which again is what the founders have in mind, and, and, but that, that didn't reappear. <laughs> I mean, I can, 9-11, God, I mean, I'm, 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 it's a Tuesday, and on the Saturday, no, the Friday night before, I went to a special screening at the Council on Foreign Relations uh, for the Spielberg movie, Band of Brothers. And then with a small talk afterwards by Stephen Ambrose. <laughs> it, it was pathetic. I mean, it, it, you know, here is the sort of upper trust of the American uh, plutocracy, all telling themselves that America is invincible, utterly invincible. And they're saying this, by the way, about an army that, as I said earlier, hasn't won an war in 75 years. And yet Ambrose is wearing a, a tie that's made out of the American flag, and they, and they have, you know, young, young cadets from West Point passing out uh, canopies. Our council on Foreign Relations. I mean, I absolutely no idea of what was about to happen on, uh, you know, four days later. We are invulnerable. Many, you know, how long can you live in a dreamland like that? I mean, we, we keep trying to do that. I mean, the Federal Reserve keeps pumping up our, our, our stock market, give us the illusion of, of um, 
infinite riches, but it's a it's a con game. And the minute they start doing that, stop doing that, it's all, it all falls apart. Yeah, it's true. Anyone else? Uh, yeah. Do you think it's actually, I mean, do you think it's a I'm loss sorry, of, I can't hear you. Sorry, do you think it's a loss of language, or do you think it's, a, it's the way that language is disseminated? Because well, I, mean, I think it's a loss of language, and, and the, uh, I mean, the, the loss of vocabulary has been uh, striking. And it, it's also, people don't take time. I mean, you can't, I don't know, I've, I've tried, but it, it's a couple of points in the course of my life I've tried to write, I've written things for television. I mean, you can't write for television. I mean, television, you've got to write a very sort of Dick and Jane kind of language. I mean, it's, it's just, you know, the, you can't have a subordinate clause. God forbid you could have irony. I mean, you, <laughs> the, the, uh, you, you, you know, it's got to go noun, verb, object, and all the words short. Well, well I mean, well, what? Well, well, I mean, I mean, you, you know. <laughs> Where would you imagine? Let's suppose you wrote the Federalist Papers. Where would you publish it? Well, but I have a question. It does seem that millennials or and younger seem to be um, say they seem to be reading more. They seem to be looking that's for true. print more. They're no, going to libraries too. more than yes, you know. No, that's true too. My generation did. I, but I, that's a hopeful sign. That I was, and I think the reason that they attached themselves to Bernie Sanders is I think it was the first time they actually heard someone speaking just normally. But I was looking, I'm trying to do an art project and I'm looking for speeches about labor. I'm trying to do an art project, I work with language, and I was looking for speeches about labor. And it's incredibly difficult in the past 40 years to find an actually good speech. That it's really scary actually when yeah. you look back, I mean I'm reading Mother Jones and reading, and you're, it's, it's shocking that I can't find anything the only thing is a Reagan speech, which I mean, the, you know, when you start searching, yeah. it's like that's what people think is a great speech of the past. And I'm not saying that there aren't any on a smaller kind of level, but I'm just saying our idea of what a great speech is. And so when we talk about language, maybe it's that there isn't, it's not that the language that <coughs> is on the, you know, on, 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 that technology has kind of ruined language, it's that there's a kind of propaganda against language, which I think somebody like George Bush, for example, was, you know, they structured him to ruin language, to have no words. I don't no, know. The the father, father, son, son. I'm saying the son, because I actually think they made him, if you hear him, you know, debate Ann Richards, it's completely different than the person who actually ended up being this person who couldn't find words for anything or had, you know, I, I mean, well, I mean, the, 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 the great, uh, this is what Toni Morrison talks about in her Nobel Prize speech in 1993. I mean, the language that we not, the, the, our language, our public discourse is, is carried out in the language of advertising. It's all advertising, for God's sake. I mean, and the, uh, I mean, the, the, the political camp, the presidential campaigns, I mean, they're like, you know, Democracy pageants. I mean, I mean, it's, the language is all trying to sell you something, and, and that, that's the language that we uh, afflicted ourselves with. Um, the Toni Morrison talks about it in her Nobel Bell speech. And she talks about advertising as the language that drinks blood. It's an language. It's a language that it's money talking to money. It's a language to preserve, um, no, to, to uh, uh, promote <coughs> ignorance and preserve privilege. And that's the language that, that, I mean, that was what Hillary Clinton was talking about. I mean, that was, you know, god awful, but, but she was trying to pretend that it was something else. but. But Trump just went straight at it. I mean, and that's why he was the more believable figure. <coughs> the greatest creative epithet since Homer, though. No, but this is all very clear in, in the wonderful essay by George Orwell on politics in the English language. I mean, if you're going to be able to think clearly, you've got to first. Uh, 
write clearly and, 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 and um, try to tell the truth. And, and probably one of the finest books I've read about American democracy is James Fenimore Cooper, published in 1832 or something like called American Democrat. And he again talks about uh, language and, and about the uh, trying to tell the truth and not put it off with, with you know, evasions. And so much of our political language these days is, is, is evasion. Um, and the, uh, that's true not only of, of the voices in Congress and the voices in, that come out of the White House. I mean, God, I mean, <laughs> and we, we try to pretend otherwise. I mean, in the summer, let's see, 9-11, um, okay, two months before, in August, people were writing in the New York Times and the Washington Post about George W. Bush as essentially a village idiot. I mean, inarticulate, stupid, right? I mean, and, and, uh, you know, kind of a fraternity kid. I mean, <laughs> two days after, no, on, on uh, two days after 9-11, the New York Times was comparing his eloquence to Abraham Lincoln. <laughs> and, 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 and the uh, Washington Post was comparing him to Churchill. <laughs> I mean, that's the kind of god awful press we have. <laughs> okay. Yeah. But now he's being re rehabilitated in light of Trump, it seems. No, no, this, I was talking about the sun. This is a, no, no, the, the sun. <laughs> not the sun. The sun. They're, they're, they're actually rehabilitating W in the light of Trump. Yeah. You know, at least he. Went to Andover or something. Yeah. Speaking of 9 11, four years later, Columbia Journalism Review sent out one of your articles um, in an article headlined, Fascism, Fascism Everywhere, But Nobody Stops to Think. And it was one of your editorials in Harper's um, that had a, an incredible uh, four paragraphs that CJR didn't pick up. Um, and it was. Um, some of your satire, uh, and it said that, I'm proud to say, and parenthetically, I, sp I think I speak for all of us here, including Senator Clinton and, and her lovely husband, <laughs> that we're blessed with the bourgeoisie that will welcome fascism as much as it welcomes the rain in, <laughs> in April and the sun in June. <laughs> um, and yeah. you go on to say that, you know, the true American, well, they're your words. And I just wondered, because I, I checked <coughs> the book published before this, and the parenthetical had been removed. So I wondered, in the dozen years since you wrote it, um, had anything changed? No, no. I, I remember writing that piece, of, I think it was 2006. It was called Odd Message. And the, uh, I stand by it. But the parenthetical. Mentioned. I can't remember. I don't remember about the character. About, I don't think I. It like about, that. Um, I think you said. Um, I'm proud to say, parenthetically, and I think I speak for everyone, including Senator Clinton and her lovely husband. <laughs> yeah. Will welcome fascism. <laughs> no, no, yeah. no. Our. I, I forgot what it first. Um, are proud of the bourgeoisie who will welcome fascism as much as it will welcome the rain in April and yeah. June. Yeah. And I was just wondering if, if, if that parenthetical had been removed from your book. Like I, I don't think so. <laughs> I, I don't know. I don't, I don't think it has. I haven't looked. You're, you're not trying to protect the questions, are you? <laughs> <laughs> On a different note, it seems to me that there are all that there are movements that come up unexpectedly, yeah. that, it, that we can't predict, 
And so every so often they come up, like Occupy Wall Street, for instance, yeah. and they change the language of what people are talking about, and then the state finds a way of coordinating the repression of those movements, and they learn new techniques, or they invent new ways of doing that, and then the movements come up again in response to those techniques, and then the state comes back. So there's a seesawing, it seems to me, between movements that spring up and the repressive mechanisms of the state. And I was wondering uh, if you could comment on that, because everything you were saying sounds so despairing. And it, it's not despairing. I mean, it, it's uh, something new will happen. I mean, I mean, I mean that's just the way history works. I mean, you, 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 history is not at an end. Okay, it's a work in progress, and it's true. You you. you you look back and you never know where the next where the next change is coming from, and and the uh, or what form it will take, and, and the uh, I assume that will happen. I mean, in capitalism is after all in, in his historical uh, construct. It's it's not a uh, law of nature. I mean, it's an idea that appears at the end of the Renaissance and then begins to appear in the 15th and 16th century and, and, and uh, Amsterdam moves to England and comes to the United States and it, it's an idea that, you know, like all historical uh, ideas, it has a you know, beginning and a middle and an end. And I don't know what will uh, replace it or how it will be modified. Because the um, you know, capitalism, if left untreated, it, it, it's a machine. It's, it's not an idea. It, 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 it's a, you know, creative annihilation. I mean, Schumpeter makes the point. Um, what's his name? Adam Smith makes the point. I mean, the uh, uh, Adams wanted to put the banks under the control of, of the Congress. I don't know what you're going to call a new idea. I mean, you know, we don't want to call it socialism, but the uh, some of us do. Uh, the Einstein thought, thought that socialism, socialism was the only possibility. Um, but but no, I, I'm not despairing. I mean, I'm, I'm saying we 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 we, we are living in a state of, of, of denial as, as to what we are uh, up against or, or what the, what our circumstances are. I mean, the, I mean we, we, you know, we're living in a hall of mirrors, I think. And, and the, uh, when I wrote this book in 1988, I thought we were going to be able to break out of it. Mm. But, uh, it didn't happen with 9-11, it didn't happen with 2008. Maybe it'll happen with, 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 with the Trump presidency. But, but how it will go, I, I don't know. But it, it will have to take some form of, of action. It, it, it can't just be um, opposing. Striking opposing. It, it can't be another form of radical chic because I mean the, the plutocracy is really good at co-opting radical chic. Mm -hmm. They do that really well. And if that doesn't work, they call it the Your colors of Benetton, right? <laughs> I think we have time for one more. Uh, yeah. So Lewis, you were uh, you had an elite education during the Cold War, and I'm wondering, did you, at Hotchkiss and Yale, did they impart any sense of responsibility? And what I'm asking is, what, you know, was the elite, the American elite, during the Cold War, uh, given 
uh, a different message than perhaps they are now? And, and if so, what, what role did actually existing socialism slash communism play in conditioning elite ideas you know, when, in your formative years coming up through those institutions? Uh, that, that's an interesting question, and I'll give you a, a fairly long answer to that. The, uh, um, I'm born in San Francisco, and my grandfather is mayor of the city during World War II, 1942, 1946. And I am a... Um, a Boy Scout, right? I, I go to a small private school in Pacific Heights. Uh, when, um, when my grandfather is mayor, he, he sometimes goes out in the launch to greet the returning aircraft carriers from the Pacific. Uh, so I can, and sometimes I went with him, and so I can remember at the age of nine uh, going on a launch and going up to the gangplank of the as enterprise and, and seeing uh, Nimitz at, 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 on the bridge and, you know, the wounded ship from the victory at sea in the Pacific. And then grandfather is, is as mayor of San Francisco, is um, uh, presiding officer over the chartering of the United Nations in the San Francisco Opera House in April, May. 1945, and he insisted that I be excused from school at age 10 to attend the plenary, plenary session. So I emerge from um, uh, into my teens thinking that um, America is the supreme pump, you know, moral. That, that right has won wrong over wrong, that, that uh, justice has prevailed, the uh, axis has been defeated, America is the supreme military, economic, and moral power in the world. Um, and the, uh, when I go to Yale I, I'm in 1952, uh, I try to get into the naval um, Air Reserve. I wanted to be a Navy pilot because as a kid in San Francisco, the, the glamour people were the pilots that would, you know, fly upside down under the Bay, Bay Bridge. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but I, I didn't qualify because I was colorblind and, and then um, I lost toes and so I, I never four a before I could get in the army, and the, uh, but I, it was just taken for granted, at, 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 as far as I was concerned, at, at, at Yale. And I'm there 52, 56, uh, that America is the supreme power in the world. The, the Yale had a, in 1953, there's a, there was a big uh, demonstration in, in the old campus. People think Yale is a liberal school, and it's just a complete joke. I mean, the, 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 the entire the student body turned out pro-McCarthy in mm -hmm. 1953. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> Yale, Yale deeply uh, establishment school. There, there is a uh, liberal minority, but it's a minority. It was a minority then, it's a minority now. Uh, the, uh, I, I take that back. I don't know about now, but the I, I didn't. Uh, I really didn't pay any attention to the Cold War. I mean, I I I, I was reading um, French novels and, and um, you know, performing in the dramat in play by you know, one of the first performances of, of Waiting for Godot. Uh, the, uh, but. Then I go to Cambridge, England, and the, uh, I don't know anything about American foreign policy. 
But I, it's the, the fall of 1956, and I begin to make friends with some of the young Brits who go to uh, uh, the, the revolution in Hungary. Six of them. That was a revolution, if you remember, after the, the CIA had promised to back and did not. I mean, America selling out its friends is. is uh, Standard policy. I mean, that's <coughs> new book by Bernard Henri Bernard Levy, you know, the French intellectual, is talking about the American foreign policy. Another story, but the uh, I can't uh, hear you. I then, uh, but 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 two of these kids are, are killed in, 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 in Budapest. And, so I am suddenly having to explain American foreign policy to very angry uh, British kids. And this is the same year as Suez. And I'm, I don't know anything about American foreign policy. But I start reading it. And the, uh, reading the Manchester Guardian, reading history, reading A.G.P. Taylor, I mean, you know, trying to really get in the game. And the, uh, and then I come back to the United States, spent a year in Cambridge, and I come back to the United States in the summer of 1957. And I've been recruited at Yale for the CIA. I mean, I, you know, two of my professors, Yale was a big recruiting outpost for the agency. And the, um, you know, they, it wasn't any heavy deal. I mean, they just gave me a, a card and they said, look, if you're, if you find yourself in Washington and you're looking for something to do, you know, call the number. And, 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 and the, I, I, I did that in the summer of 1957. The, uh, um, so I went. I applied for work at the Washington Post, the White House, and, and the agency. And at the agency at that point was in at Quonset Huts down near the Lincoln Memorial. And, the, um, it was a week, I mean, a week of physical examination and mental and language and work and so on, and I passed that. And then I got to the, uh, the interview with some of the younger guys. Some of the younger guys, right? Alan Dulles, at this point, is the head of the agency, and then his brother, John Foster, is, is the Secretary of State. Um, I met Foster Dulles, because he was a, somebody my father had known in New York. <laughs> and the, um, so I got into the interview and I, I really prepared for it. I, I, I studied, I, I, I didn't write things down on my cuff, but I, I, uh, 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 I mean, I was prepared to tell you the history of the Romanov family and the four roads through the Fulda Gap and the salinity of the Black Sea and, and the, the Finland station and, you know, the October Revolution. And, um, and I get into the interview and never forget it. And I've written this, so, and I haven't been sued. And it's, uh, at one end of the table there, there's Three of the younger guys, I'm 22, they, they are uh, maybe 28, 29, 30, um, in the agency, all Yale. And not only all Yale, but all Yale Fence Club, which was the Ivy League, White Shoe, George, they all look like George W. Bush. Um, blue button down shirt, white shoes, and so forth. And, the, uh, and during my whole four years at Yale, I had really stayed completely clear from that crowd. I, I had no interest in I, 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 I was uh, in revolt against that dominant Yale's pro Joe McCarthy's extreme of consciousness. And I spent most of, I went to one football game in four years. And, Rest of the time, the weekends I'd go to come to that village, and the um, 
<laughs> okay, so they, they, these three guys are, are interviewing me. And as I tell you, I'm, I'm prepared for high-end questions. I have a very romantic idea about the Cold War. I mean, I, I, I'm thinking you might want to be, I want to wear a trench coat and, and, and uh, take the last train from Berlin with a little bit of I mean, that, that, that was my idea of why I'm applying to the CIA. And the, <laughs> they asked me three questions, and the first question was, you are standing on the 13th tee of the National Golf Links in Southampton. <laughs> what club do you hit? <laughs> okay. I mean, they're trying to find out, am I the right sort? Do I deserve to be on the great varsity team of the Cold War? And I got that answer right because I played the golf course and I, it was a short <laughs> hole. So it's a trick question. You can ask if, you, if you're a good golfer, you hit a seven iron, and if you're not so good, you hit a three wood. Yeah, but, but I so I knew that I hit a seven iron. Pass. Question number one. Question number two. And this is serious. I mean, the, the question number two. You are. It is six o'clock. In the last week, six o'clock in the evening, in the last week of August, and you are on the. Uh, uh, final approach to the Hay Harbor Yacht Club on Fisher's, Fisher's Island, what tack do you want? I, I'd done that so I also knew that question. <laughs> <laughs> Third question, does Minxie Haynes wear a slip? Minxie Haynes was the wild thing of the the Ivy League circuit in the 50s. I mean, raving, uh, gargantuan sexual appetite. <laughs> known to every football captain from Dartmouth to the University of Virginia. <laughs> I had seen her once, uh, um, sort of dancing on the bar at the fence club. Um, I'd been sent to fetch her a drink. Her favorite drink was brandy and milk. And the, uh, but that's, and I said to these guys, I said to them, gentlemen, I, I uh, my information on, on, and I really did say this, I'm proud of myself for saying it, my information is, is secondhand in Romanian. I have, I have rumors of uh, Belgian lace and French silk, but as I say, it's, it, it, Intel is probably com compromised. <laughs> and the, uh, I got up and walked out. I mean, I, I mean the self-satisfaction of these smug, complacent assholes was beyond belief. I mean, I mean, I mean. Uh, uh, I've never been surprised at, at, the, uh, at the record of the, if, if, you, if you know anything about the history of the, of the CIA, it's pathetic. It's not only pathetic, it's comic. Uh, uh, the, uh, uh, so, I mean, that, that completely, um, um, Took me out of, out of, out of uh, that. That's the extent of, of my sort of Yale Cold War education. Right, as Robin Wink said in his book on Yale and the CIA, uh, the agency uh, started going astray in the 70s when it recruited people who didn't know their way around Florence without a map. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, Lewis, and thanks okay. to everyone for coming. And there are books for sale back there, so. Get them